uh, vice chair. Great. Um, let's get the recording started and, and get rolling down the road so folks can get on with their holidays. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today is Wednesday, December 21st, 2022. It is uh, just slightly after 1 p.m. This is the regular meeting of the Oregon Criminal Justice Commission. And uh, we will begin with a roll call of commissioners. If you would uh, take care of that, Ken, that'd be great. It'd be my pleasure. Uh, Commissioner Ogsier? Present. Commissioner Beach? Present. Uh, Vice Chair Bovet? Uh, present. Commissioner Freeman? Here. Commissioner Solomon? Here. Uh, Commissioner Przanski? Um, and Commissioner Lewis. And uh, Commissioner Brooks. We do have a quorum to do business, Vice Chair. I'll turn it over to you. Great, uh, thanks. Uh, we always start uh, off with um, an invitation for anyone here from the public that wants to speak with the commission. Uh, if you could raise your hand either visually or with uh, um, Teams mechanism, I'll call on you if there's something you want to talk to us about. Uh, particularly if there's something not on our agenda you'd like to talk to us about. So I'll open it up for that first. And not seeing or hearing anything, let's move on to our first uh, regular agenda item, which is uh, supplemental funding approval for justice reinvestment grants. And it looks like uh, maybe Ian's going to be leading that conversation. Good afternoon, commissioners. Thank you for that, Vice Chair Bovet. Um, so today, I will be presenting on justice reinvestment supplemental round funding requests, and I am coming before you today with recommendation from the Justice Reinvestment Grant Review Committee. So to <clears throat> maybe set the stage a little, when we released this supplemental funding opportunity, we knew we would have around $300,000, but we always knew that there was a possibility that the, the number of funds would increase as counties um, potentially returned funds. Um, so we invited counties to submit requests of what they needed, and they did that. And so the request totaled $739,000. However, we ended up only having available funding to cover $423,000 of those costs. You can see on the right here a breakdown of <clears throat> what the requests look like from each county. A lot of those bigger requests from the counties uh was simply because they were asking for personnel costs and so obviously personnel costs cost more than services or um you know housing for example so um and we'll we'll go through what the each county is recommended being funded for but wanted to give you a high level um, overview and <clears throat> so <clears throat> because of the amount of money available versus the amount of money that was requested. The grant review committee had hard choices all around. Um, it, they weren't the decisions that they wanted to make, but um, based on limited funding, those were the decisions um, placed before them. And so we as staff, we asked the counties to prioritize their funding requests. And we also asked follow up questions where appropriate to grantees to better understand their requests. So for an example of that might be that a county would have requested 12 months worth of personnel funding, but it was for a new position. So realistically, they couldn't immediately have someone start January 1st. And so in talking with the counties, OK, maybe 10 months is more appropriate. So a little bit of back and forth with the counties along with the prioritization got us a lot of the way there. The grant review committee also prioritized the programs in accordance with the criteria spelled out in Oregon Administrative Rule 213-060-0080. Um, that prior prioritized $150,000 of the funding towards programs that specifically served historically underserved communities. So I won't belabor that point, but I wanted to let you know that they did take action in accordance with uh, adopted rules. And then lastly, the Grant Review Committee prioritized smaller requests and chose not to fund certain kinds of requests like administrative um, costs, and they reduced some travel and training requests. So just to give you a sense of some of their decision making. So next, I'll go through the funding recommendations that they settled upon. 
uh, one by one. And so I'll go through those counties alphabetically. So the first is Benton County. The Grant Review Committee is recommending that you fund just shy of $13,000 for electronic monitoring. And this is an enhancement of their existing pretrial program. And the goal um, in accordance with Justice Reinvestment Grant Program is that it would ensure court attendance and reduce prison usage. Deschutes County, they were one of four counties um, that the Grant Review Committee identified as a program that his targets a historically underserved community. So that was one of those um, items that the grant review committee identified. And they are being recommended for funding uh, a little more than $18,000 to for gender specific cognitive behavioral therapy training. It would be an in person training that would be prioritized for Deschutes County personnel. However, they indicated that if slots became available, um, because they couldn't fill all 14 slots with the Shoots County, they would open that up statewide. So this is an expansion of existing cognitive behavioral therapy training, or excuse me, their program, but it's gender specific. So this would be uh, reestablishing a female specific CBT program. Douglas County, they requested $600 in moral recognition therapy training. $1,500, or this is what is, they are being recommended for funding, um, $1,500 for travel, and then just shy of $4,000 in supplies. This is an expansion of their RSAP program, which is their in-custody treatment program that is a key component of their justice reinvestment program. And the goal is to reduce prison usage. For Lane County, the Grant Review Committee is recommending a little more than $15,000 in crisis funds for housing assistance. This would cover things like housing applications, first and last costs, deposits, and assist with closing any gaps in monthly rent payments. And the goal of that would be to reduce prison usage. Then they are being recommended funding just shy of $30,000 for their electronic monitoring program. And this would be a no fee bracelets for pretrial defendants. And the goal of that program would be to reduce recidivism. And both of these programs are expansions. Marion County is another one of those grant programs that um, met the criteria of being a program that targets a historically underserved community. They are being recommended to receive just shy of $97,000 for a gender specific pro probation and parole officer. So this would expand their female specific caseload to have two POs. There are also some training costs associated with that, and then this would be a new program. And the goal is to reduce recidiv recidivism and prison usage specifically for the female population. Next is Morrow County. Um, they are requesting funding to <clears throat> continue to have a LIPSIC coordinator. They actually ran out of funding a couple months ago, so this would allow their LIPSIC coordinator to continue to assist the local public safety coordinating council in their um, countywide justice or criminal justice efforts, of which justice reinvestment is a key piece. They're also asking for a little shy of $4,000 for lockboxes for prescriptions as part of a new medication assisted treatment program and then $1,000 for fentanyl test strips. This would be a new program to uh, reduce overdo overdose deaths in the county. And the goal of these programs are to reduce recidivism and prison usage, as well as to promote public safety. In Multnomah County, they, uh, the county itself did not make a request. However, a few of their local nonprofit victim service providers did. The Grant Review Committee is recommending funding for two of those victim service providers. <clears throat> the first is the Oregon Crime Victims Law Center. They are recommending a little more than $15,000 for a part-time pool attorney that would help clients. And then uh, this is an expansion of an existing service, so it's an increase in from a part-time to a slightly more part-time. It's still not yet a full-time attorney, but it's an increase. In funding and then for ERCO, um, they are asking for or excuse me, they're 
recommended to receive just shy of $30,000 for a part time survivor services advocate. This is also a position that is existing, but it's part time. This would increase the amount of time that this survivor services advocate could work though with clients. There are also some monthly interpretation and translation services cost. Erco, at least with this survivor services advocate, works very closely with um, the refugee community and those that are involved or victims of human trafficking. And so um, translation and interpretation services is pretty important for that position. They are also being recommended to receive a little more than $10,000 for client life stabilization and justice system costs. And this <clears throat> request is an expansion of existing victim service programs, and the goal for both of these programs are public safety. Next is Umatilla County. Umatilla County was the third of the four county programs uh, that is that is requesting funding for a program that historic that targets a historically underserved community. They're requesting uh, a little more than or they are recommended to receive a little more than eleven thousand dollars in basic needs and transitional housing for clients that are part of their care program. And so that is a new program that was created in this round of justice reinvestment grant funding. And the care program is a full service integration of uh, identified clients that are assessed and then placed into the appropriate kind of services. And so for some of them, uh, or, or rather in all cases, they are high or medium risk to recidivate, um, but they specifically target women, especially those with children, and then those that uh, may require food or basic needs, including housing, unemployment, medical, and then culturally specific services. And the goal of this program is to reduce recidivism and prison usage. For Wasco County, they are receiving um, funding to extend the Bridges to Change and Wings programs. Those are two transitional services. services. In Wasco County, they would extend the funding to the full biennium, so it would conclude funding at the end of June 2023. And the goal of this program is to reduce prison usage and recidivism. For Washington County, uh, this this recommendation will look familiar to you because this is a expansion of the capacity building grant award that you recently made. Um, so this was the fourth of the four counties that uh, was deemed to target a historically underserved community. The grant review committee is recommending that Washington County receive just shy of $75,000 for a uh, culturally specific and culturally appropriate probation officer that works exclusively with black men. And so there would be a um, racial and ethnic, the specific caseload for that probation officer. And they are also recommended to receive a little more than $6,000 uh, for a contract to support an Afrocentric recovery mentor. That position was partially funded through the capacity building grant. So this would be an expansion of that. And then additionally, uh, a little more than $6,000 for flex funds to support the Afrocentric caseload. And those flex funds uh, could go towards things like bus tickets, incentives, basic needs, ID replacement, on and on. So those kinds of um, items would be used out with a flex, flex fund funding. This is a new program, and the goal of it is to reduce prison usage and recidivism. <clears throat> And then the last county that is recommended to receive funding is Yamhill County. They are recommended to receive a little shy of $10,000 for transitional housing funds, a little less than $3,000 for their victim service provider, Juliet's house, and then $5,000 to send two individuals to the National Drug Court Professionals Conference and $5,000 to send two individuals to the National Adult Protective Services Association Conference. Uh, and this would be an expansion of their two existing programs funded by Justice Reinvestment, their Smart Sensing Initiative, and then their Pretrial Justice Program. And the goal of these requests are to reduce prison usage and recidivism. And so as you may recall, the with Justice Reinvestment, 
uh, grant recommendations from the grant review committee in accordance with uh, changes in state law and Oregon administrative rule. You, the Criminal Justice Commission, have two options before you. You can either return the application for reconsideration by the committee or you can approve the recommendation uh, placed before you in the grant review committee. And with that, uh, that concludes my report. I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thanks, Ian. Um, do any uh, commissioners have any questions uh, for Ian or comments? Looks like uh, Commissioner Solomon has a question or comment. Ian, um, so I see that, you know, some counties have asked for fairly substantial amounts. Um, and I know that there hasn't been historically any guidance or a limit. And I'm wondering, one, why there hasn't been a cap. You know, I know in our county lane, historically, we're close to 10% of the state's um, uh, supervised population. And we've used that as kind of a rule of thumb in our asks and maybe go a little bit above, but clearly not all counties use a similar uh, metric for, for their asks. And I know that like reductions are made on smaller asks as well as, you know, these great big ass where you have some counties that are taking a larger percentage of the overall um, amount that's uh, being made available. So I'm curious about one, why there aren't caps, and secondly, how the grant review committee is making determinations around the reductions in an equitable way. Yeah, thank you for that question, Commissioner Solomon. I'll take your second question first and to say that the grant review committee in this process uh, with this particular funding request, they actually prioritized the counties with smaller requests. And so the three counties that, that made the th largest asks actually received the biggest cuts. And so mm -hmm. Washington County, for example, only 60% of their funding request was funded, um, mm -hmm. whereas many of the smaller counties were either funded entirely or only received the cuts that they specifically said they could accept. And as for the the caps, um, some of that is just a practical limitation of not knowing how many applicants there will be. Um, mm -hmm. With this kind of uh, grant funding opportunity, sometimes we get 11 applications like this time, and sometimes it's four or five, in which case we have excess funds that could have gone to fill a need that um, they would have asked for if they would have known that they could have asked for more. Okay, right. thank you. <laughs> Any other questions or comments uh, from commissioners? I'm not seeing any. I think in this case, um, before we make motions, I think we're going to need actually three motions um, because this affects a lot of counties. Um, but I, before we do that, I want to make sure we don't need to make four motions. Um, so I'll, I would prefer to stay out of uh, the vote in re respect to Washington County, my main employer. Um, uh, Commissioner Freeman, um, his main employer is Douglas County, so uh, probably ought to keep those clean. Um, and so we'll need two separate motions on those. But does anybody else want me to pull any of the rest before we take a motion on the slate? Of, uh, Commissioner Solomon, Lane yeah, County. Please pull Lane County as I chair the PSCC or LIPSIC. And yep. Yep. And, and I should say for the record, this is not because of state ethics laws. Um, I don't think any of us are going to uh, get a dime from any of this, uh, either our families or us personally, but it's just a matter of appearance, um, making sure that um, we don't uh, perceive any favoritism um, county by county. Um, all right, so um, with that, go if ahead. If I may, uh, thank you. If we, if yeah. we could also separate Ian Hill County, yeah, I'm not allowed be much to. appreciated. Yeah. Well, Thank that's you. true. Yeah, OK. Because <laughs> I got to think about all these roles that people have. That's right. OK, so if I could suggest then um, someone make a, a general motion to approve um, um, or uh, assuming somebody wants to do that, approve all of these recommendations from the Grant Review Committee with the exception of Douglas Lane, Washington and Yamhill. So moved. So moved. We got a motion from uh, Commissioner Beach. I'll take Commissioner Solomon's as a second. Is there any uh, further uh, 
comments, questions, discussion related to all the recommendations with the exception of Douglas Lane, Washington, and Yamhill. Not hearing any, Ken, if you would take the roll on that motion. Gladly. Uh, Commissioner Augsir? I'm a yes. Commissioner Beach? Yes. Commissioner Bo uh, Freeman? Yes. Commissioner Solomon? Aye. And uh, Vice Chair Bovet? Uh, yes. Okay, the motion to approve all awards excluding Douglas Washington Lane and Yamhill is approved unanimously. Great. Um, let's uh, just go alphabetically, if that's all right. If somebody, maybe other than Commissioner Freeman, could make a motion uh, to approve uh, Douglas County's request, if uh, that meets with your approval. I so move. We have a motion from Commissioner Solomon. We have a second. second. And we have a second from Commissioner Beach. Is there uh, any further discussion on the motion to approve the recommendation from the Grant Review Committee related to uh, Douglas County's supplemental JRI? Not seeing any. Ken, if you would take the roll on that one. Uh, Commissioner Augsir? Yes. Commissioner Beach? Yes. Commissioner Freeman? Abstain. Commissioner Solomon? Yes. And Vice Chair Bovet? Uh, yes. And that is uh, unanimous with the noted abstention for Commissioner Freeman. Great. Uh, next on my alphabetical list is Lane. So if somebody could make a motion with regard to Lane counties other than Commissioner Solomon. I will move to approve Lane County. This is Freeman. Mr. Freeman moves to approve the Lane County recommendation from the Grant Review Committee. Is there a second? And I'll second that. Uh, we have a second from Commissioner Beach. Is there any further discussion from commissioners? Not hearing or seeing any. Ken, if you would take the roll on that one. Yes, sir. Commissioner Augsir. Yes. Commissioner Beach. Yes. Commissioner Freeman. Yes. Commissioner Solomon. Commissioner Solomon will abstain and declare a potential conflict of interest. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Bovet. Uh, yes. And that motion also passes with the noted abstention from Commissioner Solomon. Excellent. Uh, next one on my alphabetical list is Washington County. And if uh, somebody else could uh, start talking now, I will stop. I move that we approve Washington County's request for JRI funds. Uh, Commissioner Solomon has made a motion to approve the Grant Review Committee's recommendation related to Washington County. Is there a second to that motion? I'll second that. Freeman. Commissioner Freeman seconds it. Is there any further discussion from commissioners? Not hearing or seeing any. Uh, Ken, if you would take the roll on that one. Um, Commissioner Augsir? Yes. Commissioner Beach? Yes. Commissioner Freeman? Yes. Commissioner Solomon? Yes. And Vice Chair Bovet? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Or abstain. Retract that. <laughs> this is the one I need to abstain on. Sorry. Um, uh, I, Commissioner Bovet abstains from that vote. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, and so again, we have that motion passes with the noted ex, um, abstention from Vice Chair Bovet. All right, the last one I think is Yamhill. So if uh, somebody could make a motion in relation to Yamhill's uh, recommendation from the Grant Review Committee other than Commissioner Beach. I will so move. Is there a second? We have a, a motion from uh, Commissioner Augsir. Is there a second to that motion? I'll second. And we have a second from Commissioner Solomon. Um, is there any further discussion in relation to the motion to approve Yamhill County's request for supplemental JRI? Not hearing or seeing any. Uh, Ken, if you would take the roll on this final one. Commissioner Augsir? Yes. Commissioner Beach? Commissioner Beach abstains. Commissioner Freeman? Yes. Commissioner Solomon? Yes. And Vice Chair Bovet? Yes. And that motion also passes with the noted abstention for Commissioner Beach. Great. Well, I think unless Ian tells me otherwise, I think that wraps up um, the supplemental JRI agenda item. And it looks like next we have board composition approval, burn state crisis intervention, SCIP federal grant. 
And on the agenda, it says Bridget's leading that conversation. Good afternoon, uh, Chair, Vice Chair Bovet, members of the Commission. I'm Bridget Budbill. Um, I'll be telling you a little bit about this federal grant opportunity today, and then uh, I'll be asking you to uh, confirm for us or, or give us your feedback at, as to whether the advisory board we've recommended is sufficient. Um, and that'll make more sense in a moment. Um, so thank you very much. Again, this is the Burns State Crisis Intervention Program. Um, I know Ken introduced this a bit, uh, maybe last meeting, but just as a refresher um, to kind of situate why an advisory board is being discussed. Um, this is a federal grant opportunity. Um, it's it um, was part of an amendment to burn JAG, which is something folks are probably familiar with as a federal kind of a routine federal grant opportunity for um, criminal justice programs in states. Um, this is completely separate funding, uh, just uh, for what it's worth. Um, but this particular funding is focused on gun violence reduction in states. And um, CJC is the administering agency of this opportunity. Uh, we are the only um, state administering agency as the agency eligible to be the direct applicant, but not uh, it, there are opportunities for sub awards. Um, in terms of funding, there's 3.1 that's a million available to us over uh, 2022 and 2023, and that would arrive in a lump sum. And then beyond that, um, the state has allocated to it $1.5 million every year for the next three years and then possibly beyond. And I, I should add that this is um, a formula grant. So uh, Oregon, as long as we sort of follow the rules, submit our application appropriately and follow what BJA is looking for, we should be OK to get that you know, sort of calculated allocation to us. It's not a competitive grant, in other words. Um, and then eligible subawardees are state agencies, local government entities, federally recognized tribal governments, and community-based groups. And among those groups, there are some parameters around having to share that money. So, for example, all of the money could not go to just state agencies. Some of it has to go locally, um, and so on and so forth. And if anyone has any questions uh, as I go on, please feel free to stop me. So. One of the things about this grant was, though it is, um, you know, gun violence reduction is a broad topic, the, the feds did sort of narrow it in terms of, they told us these are the priorities we are looking to fund, um, and there is flexibility within them, but they are focused on extreme risk protection orders, court-based programs um, that will allow persons with gun charges or persons who are perhaps more likely to become victims of or perpetrators of gun violence to be participants, behavioral health deflection programs, and then funding for law enforcement uh, to safely secure, track, store, and return any relinquished firearms. There is this catch-all that they use that says you may also fund related gun violence reduction programs and initiatives, uh, but it has been, you know, through this sort of uh, webinars and meetings that we've been able to attend to just keep up with the development of this grant. They do seem pretty focused on those four topics, um, not to the exclusion of others, but it just seemed to be their, their sort of main focal point. So one of the things about this grant or this federal opportunity that is unique is that, um, at least in my experience, I've not seen a federal grant require the development of an advisory board specific to the grant before. That may just be my limited experience, but this grant does require that we create an advisory board to sort of um, assist with the development and implementation of the grant itself. And the federal solicitation requires the board to include at minimum, and this is quoted language, so law enforcement, the community, courts, prosecution, behavioral health providers, victim services, and legal counsel. And in terms of legal counsel in the community, we Folks have asked, you know, for a little clarification as to what that means. Legal counsel means an attorney, and the community means members of the community. So it is pretty open-ended as to what each state sees as the appropriate folks to fill those roles. The others are a little more obvious, I think. Um, so what we've been doing since we heard about this grant is forming out work um, and trying to, to sort of develop what is the minimum number of folks, not number necessarily, but who are the, the sort of voices of expertise that should be around the table in light of the four priorities and what we know about Oregon? 
Um, the other thing that's interesting about this group is it's not just not to minimize it, but it's not only a developmental group. They also have um, the responsibility of any sub award person that, that submits an application to the CJC. They must be approved by this advisory board before then CJC can submit that sub award to the federal government for approval. So it's kind of a two step process. One, our state advisory board has to say, yes, we're OK with you submitting this to the federal government because we're okay with this being a priority in Oregon. And then two, then the federal government has to say, yes, we'll fund this too. So um, they, it is a sort of an instrumental role. So to the point, this is who we came up with. This was our list. Um, to get here, we did distribute a survey on gun violence perspectives last month. Um, we sent it to more than 700 people, really looking for lots of input. Um, and some of the key perspectives we were looking for was, I mean, we were looking for broad perspectives, but in particular, we wanted to make sure we covered impacted persons from a variety of different lenses, persons who are working to address the consequences and prevention of gun violence. And again, that has lots of different sort of angles of how you can come at that. Um, and then folks in the, the system who are a like public health care system, criminal legal system, um, who are looking for how to hold folks responsible and accountable for harms caused. Um, I would add this is, it is a 19 member group, so it is a little bit big, but it is a minimum. Um, it's not as though if we did start getting our work going and see that maybe there is a, someone who wasn't included, that it wouldn't be at the exclusion of anyone we needed to add in the future. Um, the other thing I would add real quick is that we are really hoping that this group will be full of folks who have the time and energy to participate. Um, so one thing we are looking forward to doing is, is sometimes when you get a, a, a committee, it has to be the elected sheriff or the elected so-and-so, which is great if that person has time, but we would also like the flexibility to have, you know, a patrol sergeant who is really involved in work or a healthcare provider who does this work locally also be you know, potentially represented here um, if that's sort of the right fit. Um, so I guess uh, I think folks can see this, but we do have behavioral health, two community members, and the intent for two was to make sure that we have at least two very different ideas of what it means to be from the community. Um, Community-based violence prevention, two from courts, uh, understanding that sort of Maybe one from the OJD, but I call the mothership, and then one from like a local entity would be good. Um, criminal defense, DOJ, um, two members of the legislature, uh, House of Representatives, and one from the Senate, um, two law enforcement to give folks the opportunity to maybe have a chief and a sheriff or whatever sort of combo would make sense. Um, prosecution, public health, a research institution, tribal government, and victim services. So I think I've been talking a mile a minute. Um, if anyone has questions, uh, this this is the group that we are re recommending to you. And I see Commissioner Freeman has his hand up. Thank you, and I appreciate uh, the work on this, and, and I'm generally supportive of it. I just have a question about your group, and um, not saying that this can happen, but it looks to me like the the one group that maybe isn't represented here is legal gun owners or legal gun users and i'm fearful always of a group like this that only deals with guns in a negative light passing rules or recommendations or funding organizations that, that don't have a different perspective so i'm just curious to was there any conversation about that group of people being represented thank you commissioner freeman uh, the answer is yes. And one of the things that we were sort of focused on was um, given the, uh, because the advisory committee will have a central role in prioritizing which, if any, of the four federal uh, programs that Oregon pursues, um, we left that decision. So this is supposed to be a minimum framework as we, these are the folks we see as being critical to all four of those conversations. But if, for example, ERPO was to come up as, okay, this is the thing that Oregon seems to want to pursue the most, um, then we would have the opportunity to add someone perhaps from like a gun owner perspective um, because ensuring that people understand sort of, you know, how are my rights being, um, you know, uh, due process and that sort of thing. 
uh, that would be really important to have if that was the route we took. Um, but it was it was a conversation, and we did uh, unfortunately have to trim, or we we thought we had to trim folks uh, just to make sure that it didn't become a thirty person committee from the get go. Um, but uh, again, this is why we're presenting it to you so that the commission can have this conversation. Well, I, again, thank you. I appreciate trying to be uh, as agile as you can with these boards. This is a big board, but I, I do think there's a lot of organizations out there that are. Um, you know, like I say, legal gun users or owners that want gun violence stopped and have some great ideas to bring to the table that could be beneficial in this conversation. Great. Anyone else have any comments, thoughts, suggestions for CJC? All right. Um, anything further you need from um, us at the CJC, Bridget, um, specifically? It sounds like you're just this is just an update or is there some action you're anticipating from the commission? Hi, Vice Chair Bivette, I want to make sure I'm following the agenda right. I thought it was slated as an action item, um, oh, but okay. if it's if it's not. So if it is an action item, um, I would ask for um, some sort of vote or at least a, like a public confirmation that this is or isn't enough. Um, and if there is a discussion about maybe adding a, a person um, amongst the commission, that would be great. Uh, more or less, the need to leave this meeting knowing whether this body thinks this is a good start. Yeah, it's um, other than Commissioner Freeman's suggestion, I don't know that I, I have any additional ones. You've got 19 folks listed here. I mean, um, I'm probably overstating the obvious, but um, this is has has been a high priority for the commission for a while to look into this. We gave a grant what last year I think it was to try to figure out why Oregon is experiencing some of the higher levels of, of uh, gun uh, violence. And I did just look at a report that came out last week indicating that um, the good news is, is that it looks like the murder rate uh, the increasing murder rate will be tapering off this year a bit. We're probably looking at an overall 5% decline nationwide, um, and other cities are are dropping at a faster rate. But unfortunately, um, Portland, for example, looks like they're going to wind up with an 11% increase this year over last year. So this is a, a high priority. We want to make sure we have the right people at the table. Um, to to talk about this, I myself just and I already flagged. Um, Ken to this. I would like to be on the mailing list or email list for these meetings because I don't want to roll here, but I want to listen in um, on what what happens. So um, if you've got 19, as I understand it, that's how that's how many we have here. Um, I mean, it's hard to uh, anybody else. Uh, Commissioner Solomon looks like he, he might have a, a comment as well. Um, comment and a question. So one, uh, Bridget, you may have said this, uh, forgive me if I didn't catch it, but what's the timing around the creation of this advisory board? Um, and secondly, um, I saw that you had mentioned impacted persons, and I'm wondering how we're thinking about that um, and where they would be represented. Are you thinking that impacted persons would be represented in the victim services seat or in the community member seat um, and maybe a little more about kind of the profile of impacted persons. Thank you, Commissioner Solomon. So to the first question, I, I do have a sixth slide that is like a, a sort of an estimated timeline that might help. Um, but in terms of impacted persons, we really looked at that in the broadest possible light. Um, that could be persons who have experienced gun violence, um, who have committed gun violence. Um, I mean, one of the things I think I would zoom out a little bit is uh, one of the reasons we did not show up today with a list that said um, one behavioral health manager from OHA, one elected sheriff, was because there are memberships here that, that can kind of cross over into to different realms. Um, so I mean, community member could be a person who is a, a you know, a gun, uh, a participant in sort of a gun advocacy group. Um, an impacted person could be someone who is in victim services, but it could also be someone who's a community member. I think in terms of 
um, that it was it was very much intended to be broad. We reached out to tribal governments. Um, we reached out to public health and, and the agencies across the state, um, research institutions, all kinds of things. So um, I guess I don't have an exact definition for you because it's just we understand that people are impacted so differently in, that, in lots of ways. That, that, that's helpful um, because it was my hope that you would use kind of a broad definition in part because I recognize that many people who have been convicted of crimes are also victims of crime and have experienced gun violence. And so I, I would hope that they wouldn't be excluded. And so that's helpful. Great. Anyone else have any other thoughts, comments, suggestions? Well, if we've got 19, if we're going to add more, and I've heard a couple of suggestions to potentially add more, that would bring us up to 21. Uh, I can think of a couple uh, ways to approach that, but it looks like Representative Lewis. Um, uh, go ahead, Commissioner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, just a question on the presentation. Is it? I couldn't find it in the meeting materials. Is it available somewhere on the commission website, or where can we find it? Rep. Lewis, no. It. I will make sure everyone has it after the present or after our meeting. But no, it was not sent out ahead of time. The PowerPoint is not 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 in your materials yet. Thank you. So what's the will of the commission here? Um, um, we have a list of 19 slots for this potential advisory board. We've had a suggestion that we put a firearms expert um, in addition, um, which kind of makes sense to me since we're talking about gun violence. There's been a suggestion that we have a slot for um, uh, victims, not just victim services, but actual victims. Um, to my mind, that could be anything that Commissioner Solomon mentioned could even be a a family member of a murder victim, for example. Um, that also seems like, but again, we could grow this list pretty endlessly, but those two kind of do resonate a bit with me. What do others think about that? I, I support those changes. Um, I thought uh, Mr. Freeman's, Commissioner Freeman's point was well taken, as was the suggestion for uh, an an actual victim of gun violence to join us, join the board as well. Anyone else have thoughts from the commission? You mean to try to make a motion? Yeah, might as well. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll move to, I'm sorry, Commissioner Beach had a question. My apologies. Thank you, Commissioner and Vice Chair. Um, and forgive me if I missed this, but um, do we yet know what the process will be in place of how we decide who each of these uh, representatives will be selected? Is there an application process? Commissioner Beach, we are working on that, and it is uh, as one of the sort of next steps once we formulate the sort of minimum representation framework. Um, but we have done a lot of outreach and and would welcome suggestions commissioners have for how you see if you know folks you think would be good you know this would be a good opportunity for them. Um, we're all ears. Thank you. So I will move to approve the advisory board recommendation in concept with adding the two additional slots that were talked about today. Great. We have a motion from Commissioner Freeman to approve the staff recommendation for the 19 um, uh, theoretical positions on the screen, plus adding two more, one uh, victim's representative, um, as well as a firearms expert. I'll second the motion. And we have a second to that motion from Commissioner Solomon. Is there any uh, further discussion or comments from commissioners? Just real quick, and, and I understand what this grants for and I'm fully supportive of it. I just want to make sure this doesn't become a anti-gun avenue and, and I know that's not the intent, that's not what was being presented, but um, we just need to watch to make sure that they stay focused on what the grant is actually supposed to do and that's reduce gun violence. Any other comments, thoughts, questions before we take a vote? 
not hearing or seeing any can if you want to call the roll. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, Commissioner Augsir. Yes. Commissioner Beach. Yes. Commissioner Bo uh, Freeman. Yes. Commissioner Solomon. Yes. And Vice Chair Bovet. Uh, yes. Thank you. The motion passes unanimously. Great. Uh, I think we got to your marching orders, Bridget. Is there anything else you need from us? Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Bovet. I just have this last slide. And to Commissioner Freeman's point, um, one thing that might just be helpful to know is the, so the federal solicitation is very clear that none of this money is to be used for changing laws or pursuing new laws. Um, it's, you know, you can support it if you've got it on the books, but um, that's it. So uh, just in case it, there, it would be unlawful for this to be used in an, in an advocacy role. So, um, and then to the timeline question that Commissioner Solomon had earlier, um, we just submitted the actual federal application that the state must submit this week. Um, today is our consideration of the, the advisory board framework. And then our best estimate of what's to come is we expect the BJA to be pretty quick on this to let us know if we are getting our allocation. And then we'll begin the process of trying to actually fill membership roles and, and schedule a meeting that situates folks for kind of what's to come, what their role is. Um, and then doing all the background work to make sure that what, what we're planning makes sense. So that's all I have for you today. Thanks very much. Oh, I see uh, Commissioner Solomon's got a question. Yeah. Bridget, I don't recall. I remember we had a presentation on this previously and some numbers were shared, but the allocation, is that a formulary um, allocation or is it you know, based on the application and the request that's made? Uh, Commissioner Solomon, so the state allocation is a formula grant. Uh, whether the uh, sort of sub award state sub award is a formula or a, a, a competitive grant is up to um, more or less the advisory board. And actually, we did get a question from um, a person from Lips from a Lipsic earlier this week about could this be a formula grant in our state? I, to be honest with you, I have no idea how like what the formula metrics would be, but um, just. The question itself, the federal grant itself to the state is a, is a formula allocation and then how we administer it could be, it is up to us, competitive or otherwise. Great, thank you. Great, any other questions or comments for Bridget? And not seeing or hearing any, um, let's see our last, uh, no, we got two more um, items on our agenda. Our next item is a recidivism report from, from Kelly. Thank you, Vice Chair Bovet and Commissioners. I'm Kelly Officer, Research Director at the CJC. Uh, I have a PowerPoint presentation for you today. I feel like the hardest part of this will be getting it successfully on Teams and having it work correctly. Uh, so wish me luck on that. Um, we have a report put together that we are planning to release at the end of this week uh, on an update for the statewide recidivism rates. And this PowerPoint will give you a summary of the uh, most recent, the most recent data, and then also the the trends over time. So let me see if I can pull this up. All right, looks like a good start here. <laughs> uh, so we'll start with for recidivism rates. We'll start with the definition. Many of you are very familiar with this, but to get us all on the same page, Oregon defines recidivism as an arrest, conviction, or incarceration for a new crime in three years um, from release from incarceration or sentence to probation. And so the next few slides will we'll present the data and the trends for, for this recidivism rate. Uh, before CJC even started tracking this recidivism information, um, the Department of Corrections had a process to define six month cohorts of individuals and that carried through um, in the recidivism work that we do. So the, the probation cohort are folks that start probation over a six month period and then track the three year rates from when they start probation. And then what's called the parole PPS cohort are folks who are released uh, from incarceration, either from uh, a prison sentence or a felony local control jail sentence, and then track from the release date the three-year outcomes for that particular group. 
Uh, we have to combine data from several different sources to um, compile all this information. So the arrest information comes from the Law Enforcement Data System, or LEDS, uh, that's administered by Oregon State Police. And so that includes the fingerprinted arrests. Uh, the, we use the Odyssey data from the Oregon Judicial Department for felony and misdemeanor convictions in circuit court. And we use uh, the Department of Corrections data for incarceration recidivism. So we'll jump into the, the data and trends here. So this first up, this is the parole PPS cohort. So these are folks released from incarceration. And this first blue line here is the arrest rate, the three-year arrest rate for, for these folks. So the most recent up here on the slide is for folks released in the first six months of 2017. The arrest rate is 60%. So 60% of folks are arrested for a new crime within three years. And we actually have this information back to 1998. So here we see, you know, nearly 20 years of, of this uh, outcome measure tracked over time. You can see there are certain, certain years that'll dip or come up um, from about 2010 to 2017, we do see a, a gradual increase in that arrest rate over time. Uh, next is the conviction rate here, the, the gray line. So for the most recent cohort, that is 45% conviction rate of individuals. Now this comes from a different data set and is a different measure, but you can see that the, the trend is fairly similar uh, as we would expect um, looking at arrest versus conviction outcomes. And then finally, we have the incarceration rate, uh, which for that most recent cohort displayed is 18%. So a pretty robust recidivism measure to track trends over time here. Now you'll see that this chart uh, doesn't, I haven't updated it for the most recent yet. Um, and that is because, you know, starting with the um, second cohort of 2017, we start to see the impact of COVID come in to our recidivism rate. So the way these are constructed by looking at these three-year outcomes uh, for this for this initial for this um, second cohort of 2017, thinking about COVID starting March April 2020, it's really going to start to come in at year three for for that particular one. And then those cohorts get closer to the COVID time. There's going to be more post-COVID uh, follow-up there, and so it's going to it's going to have more and more of an impact on these more recent cohorts. Uh, another important factor is the impact of Measure 110 and uh, drug possession decriminalization. And so we'll we'll get to more details around 110 in a couple slides. But that also, um, you know, the time periods, it's easy to get these mixed up. So COVID initially hits March, April 2020. Measure 110 is passed by the voters November 2022 uh, and is effective February 1, 2021. So a lot of things, a lot of big changes happening here in a fairly short period of time for tracking these uh, overall outcome measures. So I'm sure, sure you have a pretty good guess here of what happens, but our arrest recidivism rate drops substantially as COVID begins to impact this and then uh, subsequently measure 110. So for the um, for folks released in the first six months of 2019, that arrest rate has dropped to 51%, and that's the lowest rate since, since 2010. Uh, and then the conviction rate also dropped substantially down to 35%, which is actually the lowest rate we've seen going back all the way back to 1998 for that one. I hate, and, to, hate to interrupt oh, you, Kelly, but we've got a, a stack of questions stacking up, and I've, I've got to slow you down just a little bit. Uh, first, we have Commissioner Solomon, and then we have Commissioner Beach, and then there's another one that's come in too. So if you could take Commissioner Solomon's question and then Commissioner Beach's, we'll we'll move forward. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, you know, uh, Vice Chair Bovet, I can see you and I can see my okay. PowerPoint. And I, hopefully the animation is working, but I'm yeah, not. The anim the animation is working really great. If we could uh, take Commissioner Solomon's question, then Commissioner Beach's, and then Commissioner Lewis's. So got three Perfect. questions. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead, Commissioner Solomon. Thanks. A quick question, Kelly. So, with these recidivism data points, um, you indicate that Measure 110 is having an impact on the recidivism rates, and I can understand how it would impact arrests um, and convictions, but I don't understand how it would impact reconvictions you know, of people going back to prison. I mean, I, I get that it would impact the raw numbers of people coming into the system being reduced, 
but how is it impacting recidivism? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Solomon. That's a great question. And actually, you're you're uh, you're leading me well because in a couple slides we'll dig into the details. Um, but particularly for that incarceration recidivism outcome, that's incarceration for a prison sentence, but also a felony local control jail sentence. And we do, you know, pre, well, pre-measure 110, but also pre-2355, we did see um, short local control jail sentences for drug possession convictions that would be captured in the incarceration outcome as well. Um, we do actually see a very small number of prison sentences, but I would not expect that to impact an outcome measure like this. Um, mm -hmm. 30 a year, I believe. Um, and those were usually commercial drug offenses. But I, yeah, I, it's, it's those local control sentences impacting the incarceration yeah. piece. Yeah. Thank you. I think Commissioner Beach was next. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, this will be an easy one for you. Just to, to reconfirm and clarify, uh, when you refer to an arrest, and particularly in somebody that's on um, community supervision, those are only arrests for new crimes and do not count, meaning an arrest towards a technical violation. Is that correct? Uh, Commissioner Beach, that is correct. Yeah, it is an arrest for a new crime. And also the additional um, requirement is that the individual has to be fingerprinted or essentially booked to, for that to show up in the lead system to be counted um, as an arrest for new crime. So yes, excluding the um, technical violations. Thank you. And then Commissioner Lewis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Um, so I, I know that most law enforcement agencies over the last uh, uh, three years, if not longer, have experienced pretty significant staffing shortages. So is there any way to compare the data on, on arrest and also on uh, potentially on recidivism rates if they don't have the people to uh, investigate the crimes. Are you doing anything to correlate a reduction in uh, law enforcement personnel staffing with mm -hmm. this data? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Commissioner, that, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, for this particular work, we've worked to um, update this, this current information. We did some work to account for the um, drug possession changes um, the law enforcement piece, it would be a little bit trickier, but I will say we have the, um, we have the arrest trends, just overall arrests, and we see a substantial drop in March and April, 2020. And it, and it has uh, increased since then, but not to pre-COVID levels. So we can see that activity in the overall arrest information. And so it does seem like a natural jump. We would see that impact come through in our, in our recidivism rates here. Um, and then also with the traffic stop information as well, same overall trend. We see this, you know, substantial drop March, April 2020, um, and then it it has not returned to pre-COVID levels. Um, we hear also from law enforcement folks in the process of actually doing our traffic stop analysis that they are, you know, quite short-staffed and limited resources and are really uh, you know, some agencies say really not focusing on traffic patrols or officer initiated stops. Um, and so, yes, we that, you know, we would expect that to impact these these outcomes. Um, the yeah, the March, April 2020 time period is probably more about like the COVID restrictions. But then I think post that it is um, lower levels of enforcement and and staffing resources creating some some challenges there. Thank you. And Commissioner Freeman. I was going to thank you. I was going to wait to the end, but with Representative Commissioner Lewis's comments, uh, I'm going to pile on just a little bit. So here in Douglas County, uh, pre-COVID, pre-measure uh, 110, our average jail um, usage was about 220 beds. Today and for the last two and a half years, it's been around 140. So the amount of interaction our law enforcement has and the amount of deputies we have on the road uh, has been considerably less. So, uh, and I used to say this when I was in the legislature, the easiest way to lower <clears throat> your crime rate is to get rid of law enforcement officers. And that sounds funny, but these numbers are based upon law enforcement interaction and the capacity to deal with crime. And with less law enforcement officers and less capacity to deal with crime, it's going to appear there's less crime when in fact there is not. So 
you, you mentioned that towards the end of your presentation. I read through it, but uh, Representative Commissioner Lewis is exactly right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank, thank you, Commissioner Freeman. Um, I will say even before COVID, it, we could have some challenges in interpreting what, an, uh, what a recidivism rate, how to interpret that recidivism rate, right? Um, some of the lower rates we've seen are in 2009 and 2010. Uh, it's you know, likely not a coincidence that that coincides with the Great Recession and um, budget cuts to public safety systems at that time. And so while you know, in the COVID times, not necessarily having the the budget component, but still having the staffing shortages, um, and so seeing seeing that that similar trend within that, um, you know, looking at this drop from 2007, or sorry, looking at this drop 2017 to 2019, um, I'll show you in a couple slides. We've attempted to account for drug possession changes, but how much of this is the impact of overall trends of COVID? How much is law enforcement staffing? How much is um, practices for community corrections departments and the, and their supervision practices and what that is looking like, um, continuity of treatment for folks on supervision. Uh, there, this this does raise a lot of questions, um, and so we we recognize we don't have a, a solid answer to explain what is what is driving all of all of the changes, um, but just to recognize that there's been a pretty large system shift, um, and recognizing. Yeah, that a lot of this is COVID measure 110 um, and uh, lower levels of enforcement in the community. And I, I will have some comments too, uh, similar to the comments that Commissioner Freeman just expressed, but maybe I'll let you move forward with your next slide because you'll probably cover what I'm going to cover. And if not, I'll, I'll cover it then. So, <laughs> so go ahead, Kelly. I don't sure. see any okay. further sounds, questions. Sounds and then, good. <laughs> and we'll go, we'll move forward in the next slide. Okay. Great. Thank you, Vice Chair Bovet. Um, okay, so here we have here we have the the recidivism rates for folks uh, released from incarceration in this time, and so I'll kind of take it to the next group, which is looking at folks starting probation. So these are folks that have started probation and looking at those uh, three-year outcomes. A similar chart here, so that arrest rate's about 51% for the most recent cohort. Uh, the conviction rate is about 45%. Again, we see this similar pattern of um, a general increase from about 2009 through to 2017. And then the conviction rate here, which is at 16%. Uh, so again, the arrest rate declines as, as COVID and Measure 110 impact um, the overall system. Similar for conviction um, drops as well down to 38%. Uh, the incarceration rate also drops, um, with the exception of the most recent cohort, actually shows a slight increase um, to what what occurred in the previous cohort there. So that's a that's a slightly different pattern than we've seen for the other measures for the probation cohorts. Okay, now we will get into um, looking at the impact of drug possession and Measure 110. Uh, so again, these are the these are the parole PPS cohorts, folks that have been uh, released from incarceration. This is the three year arrest rate over time. The cohorts are unchanged, but we've removed drug possession as an arrest outcome for these folks in our in our attempt to look at how Measure 110 uh, impacts recidivism rates and to have something have historical rates to compare to. So if, for example, somebody is released from incarceration and then six months later is arrested for a drug possession crime, we pulled that out of the calculation. Uh, but then let's say at month nine, that person's arrested for drug possession and theft. We pulled out the drug possession, but the theft is still present. So it will still count as having an arrest in the three-year period for the theft, even though the drug possession has dropped out. So when we do that, we actually see a pretty slight change in the arrest rate over time. So the dashed line has the drug possession events removed, and that's an average of about one percentage point drop difference in the arrest rate. Now, a lot of folks look at this and say, I know drug possession is a very common recidivating crime. <laughs> Are you sure this is correct? Um, and the way that this is calculated is we're looking at the percentage of folks who, who have been arrested in that three-year period. So even though they may have picked up five arrests for drug possession, if they picked up an arrest for one other thing, they're still going to be captured in that recidivism outcome there. So we do see that gap there. Um, 
For the conviction rate, the gap is larger. It's an average four percentage point drop with drug possession removed at that time. Uh, we do see a similar trend here. And you see for that conviction rate, you do see that it is, with drug possession removed, is still the lowest historically um, back to, this, this chart goes back to 2006. Um, and so we are removing drug possession from this. We still have the impact of COVID. We still have um, law enforcement staffing challenges and other system changes built into this as well. So while we've been able to isolate just events specific to drug possession, um, there are still a lot of big changes happening in the system here um, that are also really impacting these, these rates. And then finally for incarceration, um, that drops an, an average of three percentage points. Um, you do see that these, these two lines start to, that gap narrows in about 2017. And that's probably due to the sentencing changes in House Bill 2355, where uh, some drug possession events dropped from a felony down to a misdemeanor. And so I think that's kind of what we're seeing there in 2017, and then seeing these lines narrow and come together. Uh, so I'll go ahead. I can I can pause for questions here. I have one more data slide after this one. Any, uh, I don't see any questions at this moment. Is there any questions from commissioners uh, before Kelly gets to her last slide? Looks like we have a question from Commissioner Lewis. Oh, you're still on mute, uh, Commissioner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Um, I believe it was about the same time, uh, 2017, maybe 2018, that the presumptive sentence for property crimes changed as well in statute. Uh, so I'm just curious because that's when the that's actually when that incarceration number or, uh, line changed and started the downward trend. So, mm -hmm. is there any information on how much that might have impacted? Not may, maybe not necessarily just ballot measure one ten, but also mm -hmm. property crimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, thank you. That's I think that is an an important consideration. Um, the dashed line here is the recidivism outcome with with just drug possession removed, um, and the theft outcomes or property in general is still included in that. Um, we we could we could do some exploring and to see how much the property changes would impact that too. Um, it does make me think, you know, a lot of times community corrections directors will say, you know, we talk about property crimes, we talk about drug crimes, we talk about drug possession crimes. A lot of times that is all the same activity just with different names. Um, and so that, that is an important consideration. If I may, Mr. Co-Chair, just a, an additional comment. I think um, it'll be interesting to see what happens in about four or five years, what these trends look like. But I think it's it's not a good idea to um, to uh, look at this data and assume that crime is actually dropping. I think that these other factors are probably playing a pretty significant role in what those uh, lines look like right now. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have a question from Commissioner Solomon as well. Kelly, have you analyzed these recidivism data points um, by county? Are these trends pretty consistent across the state, or are there some, you know, mm -hmm. outlier counties that are driving this reduction more than others? Mm -hmm. Um, Commissioner Solomon, that's a that's a very good question. We're working on the dashboard update uh, as we speak, and that's usually kind of our way to to pull it out by county. Yeah. Um, and and so I, I guess I, I don't quite have an answer for you yet, but we do have that data at our at our fingertips. Um, there's there's a couple components, right? There's the COVID drop. How does that vary by county? And then also the this change of pulling out drug possession. Um, I'm sure the timing of that <laughs> will vary by county, um, but the historical impact um, here, uh, yeah, depending on on enforcement resources for for drug possession um, in past years, would make sense that it would impact that as well. Um, so but, in the dashboard, and I haven't looked at it recently, but I remember when we had the RIC committees after House Bill 3194 passed. 
we would get together on a regular basis and the counties would receive data on first, second sentences, revocations, our use of prison beds, recidivism. And I found that to be really enlightening. I think our county took to heart the fact that we were sending a lot of people to prison on property crimes, much higher than the statewide average. Um, in due to previous practices in the DA's office. And so um, I, I'm wondering at what level um, that detail of data is, is still available. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Commissioner Solomon, I used, I used to be quite involved with those. So I, right. <laughs> I actually have something to, to draw from. Um, the, yeah, those, um, I agree with you, those were quite beneficial. We did get a lot of that information on a dashboard, which was great because then folks could just look, you know, go to it, look at it. It's automatically updated, um, you know, more readily available as opposed to to showing up for the presentation. But I think what was lost was getting folks in the room, having those conversations, um, you know, having folks kind of see, hey, that county looks really good and ours is a little, needs some work. Um, and so, there, um, yeah, I, I I agree with you. I think there could be some benefit in getting folks folks in a room together to um, look at some of these trends. Um, I don't I don't have it here ready for for commissioners uh, here at the moment, but we have seen that um, prison use tracking for justice reinvestment is specific to property drug and driving crimes, and nearly all counties are down substantially post COVID, um, and so that's that's looked different too. And in terms of evaluating the, the justice reinvestment programs. Um, you know, that baseline was the three years, um, I think 2012 to 2015, if I'm remembering that right. And so nearly all counties are, are below baseline post COVID as just a lot of things <laughs> have changed now. Thank you. All right, not seeing any further questions or comments. Uh, might as well proceed on to your last slide then. <laughs> Thank you, Vice Chair. All right, one more slide here, looking at the probation cohorts with drug possession removed. Uh, so the arrest rate is um, an average of a two percentage point drop. Again, that trend is very similar. Uh, the conviction rate is a little bit higher, average of about 4.6 percentage point drop here. You will see though that most recent cohort with drug possession removed actually shows a slight increase compared to that previous cohort. So that that's a that's a different pattern there for that conviction rate. And then the incarceration rate trend is an average two percentage point drop. Um, again, we see it narrowing in 2017, but then also interesting, the last two cohorts have actually slightly increased for that incarceration rate with drug possession removed as well for that particular group. Uh, so that's also a different pattern for that one. And that, that concludes my presentation. Um, I'd be happy to take any other questions that have come up. Great, um, I'll make my comments now unless somebody else wants to make some. Um, I guess I'd just like to echo what I heard a few commissioners say and, and kind of by way of word of caution with this data, uh, what it does and doesn't represent. Uh, Commissioner Freeman mentioned the easiest way to drop recidivism rates down to zero is lay off all police. Well, that's certainly one way to do it. Uh, another way to do it is to repeal the criminal code, uh, make things not a crime anymore. Uh, that's another way to do it. Uh, another way to do it is to just simply have people not report uh, crimes. Um, and so I, I wouldn't want folks to, to be misled by that. I think Commissioner Beach mentioned the connection, or, or actually it was you, Kelly, mentioned the connection between uh, property crimes and drug crimes, and we've long known of that. Uh, about 15 years ago, the Criminal Justice Commission served as staff to the Governor's Meth Task Force and did a survey, a pretty comprehensive survey, and determined that approximately 78% of property crimes committed in the state of Oregon are committed by persons suffering from addiction, stealing to support their addiction, and I don't think that should come as a surprise to anybody. Um, but what I, what I, I want people not to forget is this, um, we released data a couple of months ago out of the Criminal Justice Commission related to crime rates, um, and they don't really look that good. I already mentioned the murder rate uh, in Oregon as compared to the rest, or in Portland as compared to the rest of the nation, but we're not looking real good on property crimes either. Um, just the first six months of this year compared to the last year, 
Portland seen a over a 28% increase in property crimes, um, whereas Boise was down 17%. Seattle was up 11%. So we've seen quite a tremendous spike in property crimes. Uh, we'll get your end data here pretty soon, but I, I just wanted to note that that while recidivism data is something that's incredibly important to us here at CJC based on the programs that we uh, grant out and administer, um, we need to look at it in context. Um, and so I would echo the sentiments expressed by Commissioners uh, uh, Lewis, um, uh, Solomon, and, and Freeman uh, in that regard. And it looks like we have another question or comment from um, Commissioner Oxier. Uh Thanks, Chair Bovet. Uh you know, as we've watched this slideshow and I've listened to all the questions, I think we, we're all of the same mind is that there are just a lot of um, uh, factors that are affecting this data. And it just seems like the COVID era for a number of reasons um, was a shockwave to the criminal justice system. And, uh, and what I'm actually looking for, uh, uh, Kelly, is like a little bit of a pep talk, like, um, I feel like, you know, in a way, just the circumstances of the last two and a half years have um, rendered some of this re recidivism data kind of meaningless. And and I'm wondering if, um, can, can you tell me how, um, you know, it's kind of a shame because we had years and years of good recidivism data. I'm curious, as we go forward, um, can you tell me if there are ways where this data will start to be more meaningful and reliable and what we can glean from it going sure. forward. Sure. Thank you, Commissioner Ogzier. I, I think I'll start with, you know, even before COVID when we would present recidivism rates, right? We'd say, okay, here they are. Here are the recidivism rates. Uh, and then we'd all say, okay, well, why did it go up? Well, why did it go down? Um, and we, we didn't have solid answers to that, right? This is an overall state measure um, that we're tracking. It's not saying anything about um, the quality of programming for folks on supervision. It's not saying anything about uh, policing activities and how those are impacting it. Uh, it really is an overall metric that, that is updated every six months to say, yes, here it is. And, um, you know, for, for looking at this, when we look at the most recent cohort, we have a statewide recidivism definition and we are displaying the three year recidivism rate at that time might be really hard to interpret. Um, it might not say much about the, the system that is there, but it is the data that we have at that time. Um, so the, the interpretation's always been a, a pretty big challenge with this information. Um, I think where this will, where this has really benefited us in the past and will continue to benefit us in the future is thinking about uh, program evaluation activities, right? So when we have folks involved in a particular program and we're able to design an evaluation to figure out if that program is actually effective at reducing recidivism, these are the kind of measures that we can have to compare to a valid control group um, and then give us those measures at that time, right? If we had a valid control group um, for a particular program, even if the timing is during COVID, we can still look at those at those outcomes over that time. It'll be the same across, across the groups. Um, uh, so just some initial thoughts in thinking about about what that what that is um, looking like. You know, we'll we'll continue to track this over the next couple of cohorts. This dash line and this solid line will start to come together with with the impacts of 110. Um, and then once it stabilizes, right? Um, we we've, we've found the new normal with COVID. We've adjusted to sentencing changes. Um, then I think things will stabilize and we can track it track it again going forward and have a better understanding of it's not just that the whole world changed um, you know it's these very specific system changes that we can track what, what is happening with these with these rates all right any other uh, questions or or comments for Kelly looks like uh, Commissioner Lewis go ahead thank you mr co-chair <clears throat> uh, Kelly you mentioned earlier that there's the report is coming out soon um, in light of the discussion that we've had and the concerns about how recidivism data is used is there anything in that report that indicates that there are some disclaimers um, and that it should be taken into context um, when considering like ballot measure 110 and 
uh, police staffing and so mm -hmm. on. And that mm -hmm. I, I'm hoping that that's in that report because I know from the legislative side that people take a look at that data and say, oh, things are working great. Uh, crime rates going down and arrests are going down and so on. If you don't look at the whole picture, uh, there can be some real misconceptions. So hopefully there'll be something in that report that indicates some of the concerns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. That That is a um, a pretty important consideration. We do have, I went ahead and backed up a little bit just to kind of mention um, this descriptor here, right? Lower levels of enforcement and staffing short falls likely have an impact. So we have several references in there about the impact of um, COVID, Measure 110, and also lower, lower levels of enforcement. Also recognizing too um, that this, this isn't really used to say that things are going well or not well. <laughs> it is really just this measure over time um, that, that gives us some context here. Um, you know, it, it is true that we're seeing fewer folks recidivating who are releasing from incarceration. That is a true statement. What is driving that is um, is likely COVID and Measure 110. And so, um, yeah, we tried to try to make sure that, that that's clear in that report. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Commissioner Freeman, go ahead. So not, not to be argumentative, but the data does not show there's less recidivism. The data shows there's less reporting of recidivism. This is a reporting, not, not what's actually happening. So mm -hmm. we just have to remember that. And I believe there's a concern about the difference between the actual crimes that are being committed, the arrest, incarceration, and reporting. So I think that's a valid concern mm -hmm. yeah Th thank you commissioner yeah well I, th I think the the reference to the enforcement and the staffing um i hope hopefully will will address that that um concern we do we have we have a challenge right in that um we have these administrative data sources that do a good job of collecting this information but we don't know what's not reported or what's not collected and when those factors change, then that really is quite a challenge to us. I think recognizing that COVID has changed that um, is, is an important consideration. I would just, uh, from my perspective, I would just echo what you've, you've heard. Um, even though I think technically recidivism is based up on arrests and convictions, uh, again, that gets back to Commissioner Lewis's point, if you don't have enough police officers to investigate and make arrests for new crimes, then uh, it doesn't constitute recidivism. So I, for my part, I would just urge CJC staff to be very careful with your word choices, because if the media runs with your release and says, hey, crime's down, that's actually the wrong message. As I already mentioned, it looks like the murder rate in Portland has gone up 11% this year over last. Uh, the data we released uh, just a couple of months ago showed that um, property crimes are spiking uh, over 28% this year over last so far in Portland alone. So I, I wouldn't want the media to run with um, data and tell Oregonians um, um, something that's just not true. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. All right, any other questions, comments, thoughts about the recidivism report we've had from Kelly? If not, thank you so much, Kelly, for presenting all this data to us. Look forward to where it goes in the next few years, actually, because I'm tracking what you're doing here, um, and I'm hoping other folks are as well. Um, all right, so what do we have left on our agenda? Agency updates, we got um, Kelly again, plus Ken and Ryan. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Bovet. Um, what we're what we're going to start doing on our agendas for agency updates, because sometimes the information that we gain that we want to update you with, uh, it may come in past some of the posting periods for our agendas, is we're going to start putting a block onto all of our agendas um, for myself and for Kelly and Ryan uh, collectively to provide whatever updates we have. And so sometimes you'll hear from all three of us, sometimes maybe just one of us. Um, and then I have a couple updates uh, just in, in general, but I, real quick, I did want to just mention that um, this this discussion that we had today about the recidivism report has been extraordinarily valuable, and it's exactly why we wanted to put on the agenda today. You know, historically, when we have released our recidivism information, while we may have, you know, informal discussions with different associations or different stakeholders as to what we hypothesize as driving differences that we might see, we've really tried to shy away from 
causal explanations in, in our reports. However, with these recent trends, and especially in light of all of the uh, potential causes that, that have been discussed here today, we decided to try to back away from that a little bit in this report to try to, first of all, from an empirical standpoint, uncover some of the causes. Um, and that was looking at the Measure 110 impact. I can't speak for the other researchers in our office, but I expected that impact to be larger. Um, and so what's very interesting to learn from that is that the alternative explanations, whether it is staffing, reporting, or any of the others that we talked about today, they're actually playing a larger uh, role than we may have suspected before this report was released. And so while we can't uh, precisely uh, you know, specify what share of that uh, reduction each of those other factors is playing, that's where we're trying to head. We have uh, work that's being done on uh, different COVID trends, which could impact, you know, the staffing and other uh, reporting and, and other other items. And so we're trying to weave those together so that we can offer a more accurate explanation. And I think that what Rep Lewis uh, identified is a really important one, too, is so that when we have folks who are in the legislature who are setting budgets or policy, that they have the information that they need to actually make sound decisions. And so I just wanted again to thank you all for the input you had here today. And that's why we also did not want to release this report. And so we had this more roundtable discussion um, for my quick updates, unless there are any questions about that. Um, I just wanted to mention that we have been having some discussions um, at the staff level with the governor's transition team about budget. Um, we anticipate the budget you know, to be uh, released early next year. Um, we're hopeful. Um, we have a lot of asks, as we've described here in the past uh, couple meetings. Um, and we're hopeful, especially for JRI um, and uh, possibly for restorative justice to maybe have some support there. Um, our legislative concepts are also still on hold. We're waiting to hear from uh, the governor's transition team um, uh, to get the green light on those. And we expect those discussions that we'll have to have some meetings with them before those are approved to go forward. Um, the last two things I wanted to mention are more about the process that we have been um, using here at the uh, um, at CJC for our meetings. The first is um, what we're moving towards to try to centralize all of our materials for meetings and especially materials following meetings is, you know, Jenny, um, as we've been doing before, will send out the agenda and any materials like the um, uh, like the one page summaries of grants beforehand. Um, and sometimes those will come out in a slightly scattershot form as we as we get them together. However, what our new uh, process will be is following meetings, we are going to uh, republish the agenda, but with every single attachment, all of the meeting materials that we covered during that meeting. That would be sent out to both the commissioners, but then also posted on our website. Our website's gotten a bit full with all the things we've posted lately because it'll have an agenda, then it'll have a separate item for everything else. We're trying to make it much more streamlined for folks to be able to get the information that they need from us. And so you can look forward to that um, in the near future. The last thing I wanted to raise is more of a question for commissioners. Um, we have been doing this uh, song and dance from my home, perhaps, or from you all in your various offices or, or, or different spots for a couple of years now. And um, I think that it would be nice if we have kind of the will of our commissioners uh, to perhaps start meeting in person again. And so what we had discussed um, many, many months ago uh, during different waves when we always thought we were getting away from COVID was perhaps going to a schedule where we would have um, quarterly in-person meetings with then virtual meetings in those intervening months. Um, but one thing I've, I've always been a little bit wary of in going back to in-person meetings is that we do have a pretty substantial geographic spread amongst our commissioners. And I would hate to make some of our commissioners either always have to phone in and not benefit from the in-person um, meetings or you know, always have to drive. And so one thing I, I took from um, a meeting that I, I went to with the LECC is they will oftentimes do essentially an LECC roadshow. And so I was going to propose and see if folks uh, kind of like this idea that perhaps what we could do as we look for quarterly meetings in the future is begin to have some remote CJC meetings, but try to house them at least for the first year in the counties of some of our commissioners. Therefore, you know, if we go down to Douglas County for a meeting, we could turn that into a meeting that is hosted by Commissioner Freeman, not to put you on the spot, but then also we could perhaps have that as an opportunity 
to learn more directly about those counties that we're serving. Uh, we could have a slightly longer meeting. We could have uh, representatives from different county offices or different grant recipients actually come and make presentations to us. And so that could be for Douglas County, Lane County, Columbia County, any of the counties covered by our commissioners. And so I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, you know, we could meet in Salem here and there um, as well. That might be a little more boring, but I uh, just wanted to put that out there and see if we I have any uh, feedback, whether positive or negative. Um, or any thoughts uh, to kind of add to that as we try to build that out for this uh, upcoming year. Looks like Commissioner Solomon has some thoughts. Yeah, after decades of driving to Salem, I've been waiting for the road show. Um, so <laughs> yes, uh, I would wholly support um, you coming to various counties and would be willing to drive as well to um, the the counties where um, other commissioners reside. So I would I would fully support that. Great, great. <laughs> Commissioner Freeman. So, so I also support that concept. Um, and another uh, role that I have is um, the president of the Association of ONC Counties. We do exactly that. We move our um, meetings, our board meetings around all the different member counties. And it's actually quite interesting to go to all the different counties and learn about, you know, sort of different parts as a county commissioner, we have the saying, uh, Rob will know this, you've been to one county in Oregon, you've been to one county in Oregon. So it is kind of nice to get out and see other counties. Great, I would just echo what both of those commissioners just said for my part. Anyone else want to chime in? Vice Chair, this is Commissioner Beach. Go ahead. Uh, just that I'm in total agreement. I think this is a great idea. Um, you know, we, on a regular basis are asked to um, see presentations and make big decisions. And I'll just speak for myself that I think um, more discussion is generally rendered in, in person. Um, and I also love the idea of learning about the other counties of the other commissioners as well. So I fully support it. Commissioner Lewis. Oh, you're on mute. You would think by now I'd know to take that off of you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I I just echo what everybody else said, but I I would ask that if we're when we're doing Salem meetings, or at least when we're in session, if we can do the meetings in Salem, that would be helpful. The rest of the time, travel is great. Sounds good. All right. Anyone else with thoughts? Sounds like you're hearing a pretty strong consensus toward moving uh, moving toward what you just said, Ken. Yeah, no, I, I'm excited. I think that that sounds really good, and I'm it's really nice to hear such support. Um, so I think what we'll do is is staff will get together and we'll plan out when those quarterly meetings should be held. Um, you know, if if we kind of go on a regular quarter schedule, maybe we do look at Salem um, for our March meeting, uh, given the legislative session. Um, but then if we're looking at, you know, a late June meeting, perhaps that should be after Sine die. And so then we could do our first little roadshow then, and then we could go from there. And so what we'll do is we'll look at the calendar and then we'll begin to reach out to folks just on some of those general months to see if there are good times or bad times um, for the different commissioners uh, to, to do a little hosting. But of course, um, by hosting, we may need a space, but uh, uh, staff will still be taking care of the lion's share of all of that. So I don't want folks to think it's also going to be a big uh, time suck for them. But um, that's all that I have for today. Um, Kelly, I think, has just a few updates on uh, closing out our reporting year uh, from a research standpoint, but I think that will be the uh, the last for us today after she's finished. Great. Uh, go ahead, Kelly. Thank you, Vice Chair uh, and, and Commissioners. Just a quick update on uh, end of year reporting and projects that the that the research team is up to, and this overlaps some with our programs team as well. So we have several um, grant related legislative reports due by the end of the year. So one is the impacts grant report, um, and that, that one is coming along pretty, pretty nicely. And that one doesn't run through through this commission, but I know you all, a lot of you are very familiar with that. Um, and then the IMMEGP or the marijuana grant report is also due at the end of the year. Uh, so we'll be wrapping that one up. And then finally, we have the Justice Reinvestment Avoided Cost Report due January 1. Uh, so that will wrap up our kind of legislative deadlines around the grant reporting. 
Uh, and then finally, we've been putting a lot of work into um, redesigning some of our dashboards. And so some of it is similar information that's already available, but has we think it looks better and is clearer. And then has also added some additional information um, to some of the uh, overall trends that are up on the dashboard. So we put a lot of work into that and are hoping to release that in the next couple of weeks as well. And that'll wrap up the uh, research update for today. Fantastic. Sounds like you may need a post-holiday holiday vacation after all those reports. Uh, anyone have any questions or comments uh, for Kelly or Ken? Or in general, I think we're at the end of our agenda now. Just Merry Christmas to everybody. Yes, happy holidays to everyone. I hope you have a great new year as well. We are adjourned. Happy holidays. Thanks, everyone.